alone with peace among all the nations in the, of the Northeast Asia. Can Europe contribute to peace on the Korean Peninsula? What role can be played by Russia, which connects to Europe and Northeast Asia? Can parliamentary diplomacy help move forward the long-awaited peace process in this conflicting region? We will talk about all these issues in this webinar. Before we start uh, the substance of today's webinar, I'd like to explain some of the technical aspects. The globe on the lower right-hand side is for translation. Please click on the globe and choose your language. If you need Russian, choose Russian. If you need French, French, etc. If you are an English speaker, please still choose English, uh, since we will have panelists who will speak in other languages. To ask questions to our eminent panel, please use the question and answer button. After the main speeches of our panelists, we will have time for questions and answers. And now, uh, for the opening remarks, I would like to invite Mr. Peter Heider, the coordinator for UPF's Association of Parliamentarians for Peace in Europe and the Middle East, and the president of the Universal Peace Federation in Austria. Peter Heider, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for your kind introduction. Honorable members of parliament, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Vienna, still the city of the Blue Danube. The International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace, in short IAPP, was launched at the National Assembly of the Republic of Korea on February 15, 2016, more than five years ago, as a worldwide association of parliamentarians, which provides a forum to bring their experience and wisdom to bear on the search for solutions to our world's problems. The parliamentarians play a central role in nations throughout the world, representing the people, respecting the rule of law and upholding human rights and dignity. The work to build safe, secure, peaceful and prosperous societies. IPP in Europe was inaugurated in September 2016 in the Houses of Parliament in London, UK, during a conference entitled Interregional Dialogue Addressing Critical Challenges, Europe, Eurasia, the Middle East and North Africa. Since then, several conferences have been held in different parliament buildings in Europe, uh, like in Portugal, in, in Kosovo, where I personally participated, and in several others, also in the UN in Vienna, where we inaugurated IAPP in September 2016 in a conference uh, during the International Day of Peace, and we also had already two conferences organized in the European Parliament. Our topic today is Korea. Following the World War II, the Korean people who share a common history, culture and language were divided by the Cold War struggle between superpowers. And 17 year, 70 years later, considering its potential impact on global peace and development, the peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula is a central focus of IAPP, along with peace among all the nations of Northeast Asia. As you might have heard, our founders, Dr. Sun Myung Moon and his wife, Dr. Hak Cha Han Moon, come from Korea. They were both born in what we now call the, is called the DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Their long life dream has been to see Korea united again. 
He visited North Korea in 1991 and met President Kim Il-sung and this started a process of reconciliation between the North and the South. For 50 years, Korean people were occupied first by Japan. And now for 70 years since the Korean War, it has been a divided nation. Korea deserves the firm support of the international community so it can come together and be united again. It was in many ways the international community which inflicted the pain of the unfortunate division on this innocent country during the final weeks of the Second World War in the Far East. And as Maria said, we want to discuss the role which Europe can play in its relationship to encourage a reconciliation and finally a unification of North and South Korea. And also, of course, important, what kind of role can Russia play as it is bordering to Europe and also it, it is a border country to North Korea. And can parliamentary dip diplomacy help in some way, especially to move this peace process? First, uh, I want to uh, apologize for Honorable Lucas Mandel, who promised to be part of our conference. Unfortunately, he cannot be with us today because he uh, is in a plenary session of the European Parliament. He, he was with us a few weeks uh, before and he was, I think, quite inspired to see that here is an organization which takes this vision for a unified Korea series and promotes it through many conferences. And in this way, I hope that today's meeting also be another step forward, which can bring North and South Korea closer together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haider, for your welcoming remarks. It has given us a background to understand the work of International Association of Parliamentarians for Peace. <clears throat> now, allow me to invite our first speaker, Dr. Michael Balcom, who currently serves as the president, uh, regional president of the Family Federation for World Peace for the combined 72 nations of Europe, the Middle East, and Eurasia. Dr. Balcom, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Maria, and good afternoon, everyone. Well, first of all, I have to apologize for not being the Honorable Lucas Mandel, who, of course, would be much more qualified than me to speak on this topic. Uh, but I'll do my best to make a meaningful contribution. Uh, the first question that comes to my mind when looking at our title is whether parliamentary leaders from Europe or Russia or indeed any third country can reasonably expect to offer a contribution to the peace process on the Korea. I mean, I often hear people saying something like this, that's a matter only for the Korean people to resolve. And furthermore, any outside involvement will be ineffective and quite possibly unwelcome. Well, I'm gonna disagree with both of those objections. First of all, as we already heard from Peter Heider, the division of the Korean Peninsula, now three generations ago, wasn't brought about by the Korean people themselves. The immediate cause, of course, was this great power negotiation at the end of World War II, which were intended to prevent further war in the Asian theater and provide some kind of buffer between the communist world and the demographic forces. Uh, but that failed, of course, and the Korean War that broke out in June 1950 led to millions more deaths. Now, here in the United Kingdom and in my other homeland of the United States, we remember rightly, I think, the brave soldiers who went to Korea under the banner of the United Nations to fight and die for peace and democracy as they understood it. And to me, it's really astonishing how readily they were willing to do so, given that the horrors of World War II were a recent memory. Uh, and many other nations joined in too, and their sons also rest in Korean soil. At a recent rally of hope, I was moved to hear a Belgian war veteran say that despite the loss of life, 
he thought it was worthwhile because of the free and prosperous country that South Korea has become. But I've been reminded by my friends in Moscow and Beijing that there were many hundreds of thousands of other young men who went to Korea to fight for what they believed was their patriotic duty. I'm talking about those Russian and Chinese soldiers who died in the hills and the valleys of Korea. And I'm very happy to recognize the Honorable Omarov of the Russian Duma here today. So in conclusion, no matter what side the soldiers fought on three generations ago, I think we have to agree that the Korean War and the division of Korea was never just about Korea. It was the result of the clash of global forces. And so it always was our business and it remains our business today. Well, what about the second objection that outside help will be unwelcome and ineffective? And there I would have to say, it depends. Sometimes we do need an intervention from the outside to resolve a problem or a dispute. When our UPF founder, the late Dr. Sun Myung Moon, came from his native Korea to work in the United States in 1971, he described his role as that of a firefighter and a doctor, a firefighter to try to put out the fires of conflict and disagreement in the United States body politic. It was, after all, the time of Watergate but also a doctor to heal the wounds that Americans were inflicting upon each other, particularly the young people trapped uh, in immorality, sexual immorality, drug abuse, radical politics, and, and all manner of social ills. And he commented that the patient may protest, but if they want to get better, they can't push aside the hands of the doctor. So the core question for us this afternoon is whether parliamentary leaders can in fact be firefighters or physicians. Well, here in the United Kingdom, I think back to the peace talks in Ireland 25 years ago, which brought to an end decades of violence and conflict, not only on both sides of the Irish border, but also to an end to the terrorist bombings in the United Kingdom. Now, peace efforts had been going on for some years, but they were stuck because neither side was ready to make enough concessions. Neither side was ready to sacrifice old grievances and suffering for the sake of future peace. And frankly, to accomplish the task, we needed help from the outside. And that help actually came from a parliamentary leader, the United States Senator George Mitchell, and the groundwork that he established for the peace process, the so-called Mitchell Principles which all parties came to accept. So I would say that history tells us that parliamentary leaders can indeed play a peacemaking role both inside and outside their own nations. But, and it's a big but, in order to bring that about, we're talking about parliamentary leaders functioning at their best and not mired in partisan and self-centered disagreements that infest so many of the democratic nations today. For example, here in the UK, in the middle of a global pandemic with humanitarian crises raging everywhere, the main story in the press is how much the Prime Minister spent on refurbishing his apartment. Uh, it's not about the millions or tens of millions that have been cut from our global budget for aid, but about a, a trifling partisan thing. Now, my wife and I were present in the United States Senate in the Kennedy Caucus Room when Mother Moon inaugurated the IAPP back in 2016, just three weeks after the election of Donald Trump and the Republican Party into power. And at that meeting, I remember clearly Mother Moon sounding a note of alarm at the toxic relationships of mistrust and division that were already brewing on Capitol Hill. And she reminded the senators and congressmen, Democrat and Republican, and indeed the representatives of many other parliaments who were there that day, that their first duty was not to their political party or their faction, despite the normal adversarial role of parliamentary politics. But they should remember the people who elected them, their long-suffering constituents. And going further than that, she ventured to say that the fact that they held political office at all was much more than simply the result of a vote. She said it's a matter of fate, or she described it, heavenly fortune, even the will of God. She said, thinking back to the first parliaments of America, these leaders have a duty beyond their nature, and she encouraged everyone to work together for a common purpose. Well, as I said, I'm 
a bit disconcerted by the lack of progress in the last five years. Um, there are scandals raging every day in the United States, in the UK, and I've heard that it's the same in other countries. I'm shocked. I, I'm deeply shocked. The fact is, we're not going to make any meaningful contribution to peace if we continue to focus on our own narrow interests or scoring political points off each other. The Korean people won't listen to us if we continue to act like that, and indeed, why should they? But nevertheless, I think this international leadership conference is pointing a way forward. Certainly, we are calling on parliamentary leaders from all nations to put aside party politics and self-interest and take up that risky but rewarding and necessary role of a fighter, a firefighter and a doctor. And we're not stopping there. We're also considering in other sessions the equally significant roles of other stakeholders, religious leaders, women leaders, especially first ladies, economists, artists, academics, to name but a few. This interdisciplinary approach, which is a very distinctive feature of the work of UPF, is a very hopeful sign. But even that's not enough. And our founder, Dr. Hakan Moon, has added a spiritual dimension too. And she's reminded us that some problems are beyond mere human effort. We need to seek God's help, however we may perceive the divine. Working together, we have an opportunity to bring to an end one of the great unresolved conflicts of the 20th century. Let's not hesitate in front of this great task. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Balcom, uh, for your important insights. Uh, before I invite our next speaker, I would like to remind those of you who are listening to our webinar in English to choose English at the globe on the lower right hand side. This will enable you to hear the English translation of our next speaker's words. I would like to invite Honorable Gajimurat Amarov. He is a long standing member of the State Duma of the Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation. He is also deputy head of one of the parliamentary political parties in the State Duma of Russia. Honorable Amarov, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me to participate to this webinar. Also, I warmly welcome all my colleagues who attend this program. I was very really interested to hear Peter Haider explain about IAPP with a lot of content, Maria. Also, I highly appreciate Dr. Belcom for his speech. He said so much of what I was going to say. He expressed his heart and his mind. I hope I'm being translated. Of course, last night I came back from a big trip to four nations across Africa. I visited several nations, including Sierra Leone, with the recent civil war being finished, it continued for years. And I do remember in front of my eyes, destinies, lives of those states, peoples were affected so heavily. And I remember the situation on the Korean Peninsula of course, being in Seoul, we discussed many times the future of the Korean Peninsula and uh, at all meetings there is the same issue about the Korean reunification. And if the parliament parliamentarians can play a role to assist peaceful reunification, how to do that? Who can influence positively? And the whole world must be involved uh, in resolving this issue, whether it's in Korea, whether it's in Africa, anywhere else, we are, should all be one. And today, uh, under the situation of pandemic, 
in India, in other countries, we see tragic events. So we really call upon mankind to unite. Russia supports the Korean Peninsula for 20 years. We have an agreement with the uh, cooperation agreement with the uh, North Korean state, and uh, we have 30 years of diplomatic relations with South Korea. And Russia is applying all efforts to assist the peaceful reunification. Uh, more than politically, even in the sense of economy, Russia and our allies are trying to help as much as we can. Today is the 21st century. There is no one country in the world, even uh, the most developed, can not develop by itself without good communication with the other parts of the world. Therefore, now it's the age of internet, technology, communication. Therefore, we should come to North Korea. We should provide the technology and communication means. We should show the world to North Korea. We are all the inhabitants of one little planet Earth. Therefore, the pain of the people in North Korea is perceived very closely but by anyone anywhere in the world we are all humans and uh, we must not be indifferent secondly every state has a certain political agenda there would be a nation pursuing their own interests we have to keep that in mind same korean issue it lasts for more than 70 years for the Koreans themselves uh, living in the south and in the north, this problem was imposed from outside. Now it's the 21st century and we all have to come back, come together and think how to assist the development of Korea and uh, how to be useful for the Korean reunification. Therefore, all the limitations and sanctions which are imposed on North Korea unfortunately often create the opposite effect. They create vacuum around North Korea. Uh, we are concerned. The Korean people are one nation. They could be far stronger if they were united. Uh, they have a historic chance to go around the world. And we as a parliamentary workers, we must do anything we can to help reunification. Dr. Balcom said it very, very right. Other countries around Korea must put off their own selfish agendas. Peace, justice are far more significant than interests of one certain state. That is my stand and I'm all for participating, assisting at any conference, at any event really to go and support uh, first uh, any project to reunify the Korean Peninsula. And this is also the stand of the Russian Federation. Our country supports uh, all efforts to unify the Korean Peninsula and we will work more and more for that. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Uh, indeed, mutually beneficial economic projects create the basis for peace and security. I know Honorable Amarov should leave us uh, soon for some meeting. So uh, with your permission, I would like to ask him uh, one question. So uh, uh, Honorable Amarov, if you were invited to join the international delegation to North Korea, what are the main issues would you like to consider at the meeting with parliamentarians of the DPRK? Uh, 
Thank you for your question. Of course, if invited, I will be happy to visit and uh, to meet the parliamentarians. And I do want to create a group of parliamentary leaders uh, in our country. First of all, really all of them should put off their personal agendas and uh, to find out what efforts we should do as parliament to help the reunification. So we will ask the parliamentarians of North Korea what kind of efforts we as parliamentary leaders should do so that we could facilitate the reunification on the Korean Peninsula. We, they have to really stand uh, strong and uh, take initiative to reunite their country. Uh, thank you, Honorable Amara. So let us now move from Russia to Italy. Allow me to invite Senator Roberto Rampi, who serves as a second uh, serves a second mandate uh, as a member of the Italian Parliament, and he was also appointed to be a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe in 2018. In 2020, he was elected member of the Interparliamentary Alliance uh, on China. Let us watch the presentation by Senator Rampi. Dear Dr. Otsuka, Dr. Marion, and Dr. Balcom, and dear Mother Moon, and uh, to all the people who are listening, good afternoon. Commitments in the House do not follow me to participate online, but I'm really pleased to send my message. I've been a member of the International uh, Association of Parliamentarians for Peace since uh, the founding in 2016. And I've been part of UPS for longer. As ambassador of peace, I can testify the great work that UPF is doing all around the world. And I've been personally involved in dialogue and reconciliation process, especially in the one Middle East. And I'm ready to continue in other parts of the planet. UPF effort under the Mother Moon leadership on every continent are exemplary. The Korean people have been divided for long, too long. And I, in order to facilitate the process of dialogue and reconciliation for a peaceful reunification of Korea, in which I strongly believe, as a politician involved locally, nationally, and internationally, uh, interdisciplinary work are really important. Since, uh, since I'm um, also involved uh, in cultural level, I'm really convinced that initiative, uh, such an uh, artistic one, and all various uh, discipline and sport are an uh, immediate means of breaking down barriers. In these, Italy and Korea have much in common. The 13th parla parallel also pays our, our peninsula, and we are a peninsula too, and we can organize together many initiatives of exchange with both to Korea that have been the same cultural and traditional roots. I'm also av 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 able with my parliamentary colleagues to be active part of this process. I wish all of you involved in that international leadership conference good work and I encourage and I encourage to move forward, especially toward the upcoming inauguration think tank in 2022. Dreams always come true. And let us believe in dream and give uh, hope to the Korean people through our joint and the fruit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Rampi. Uh, indeed, uh, the cultural programs are the important tool for peace. I'm sure we will work uh, a lot in the future on this as well. Now I would like to ask our next speaker to share his insights with us. Honorable Keith Best, 
the, uh, he currently serves as the chair of the UPF UK. He has been a long-term executive member and CEO of the World Federalist Movement, and he is a former member of UK Parliament. Uh, Honorable Keith Best, uh, the floor is yours. Well, it is a privilege to say a few words today on the topic of closer relations with DPRK through the medium of parliamentarians. I believe that parliamentarians who are not members of their government can make a significant difference. And I want to quote just one personal example. After the Falklands War in 1982, when the Argentinian junta fell and democracy was restored, I found myself as a member of the British parliamentary delegation to the Interparliamentary Union meeting in Geneva, which was the first time in years in which a democratic Argentina had been present. I took it upon myself and my British colleagues to invite their delegation to have lunch with us to discuss matters. Now, you must appreciate that relations were still raw after the bloodshed in the war, but we were able to speak frankly, not agreeing on the true sovereignty of the Falklands Malvinas, but nevertheless, at one, in wishing the dialogue to continue. On my return to the UK, however, I was wrapped firmly over the knuckles by the then Foreign Office Minister for having stepped out of line from official policy, which was to maintain an aura of hostility, and that my overture to the Argentinians had been very unhelpful. Yet, we as parliamentarians had broken the ice and enabled a dialogue to happen. That is an example of how parliamentarians can truly make a difference when their governments are unwilling or unable to do so for reasons of policy. In the UK Parliament, we have an all-party parliamentary group for North Korea, as it is entitled, with the stated objectives to formulate solutions that promote and support human rights, democracy and security in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, to establish relations with the exiled North Korean community, to foster understanding of the DPRK and the challenges which face its people, and to explore meaningful relations between the parliaments of the UK and the DPRK. Now that is good as far as it goes, but a meaningful dialogue is needed not just with the dissident diaspora from DPRK, but with the current leadership, if progress is going to be made in reducing misunderstanding and building trust, which after all is the essential foundation for any future agreement on any issues, whether geopolitical, insecurity, or commercial and cultural interchange. We need such parliamentary groups in as many countries as possible, and that's a real role for the IAPP. Succeeding generations pay a heavy price for the way in which we forge our borders, as history shows. Most of the major conflicts have been and continue to be caused by disputes over boundaries often the result of territorial aggrandizement through armed aggression, flawed treaties, effects of colonialism or redistribution by victorious powers. So many of our borders today cut across natural, ethnic, linguistic and cultural entities. When visiting Potsdam towards the end of the Cold War, I was intrigued to see displayed on the walls the blank maps of Europe on which Churchill, Stalin and Truman are drawn thick red lines indicating future spheres of influence, oblivious to those characteristics. We all know the story of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, the 1916 secret treaty between the United Kingdom and France with assent from the Russian Empire and the Kingdom of Italy to define their mutually agreed spheres of influence and control in an eventual partition of the Ottoman Empire and how it so betrayed Lawrence and the Arab cause. The unrest today in the Middle East is largely occasioned by that legacy more than 100 years later. I recall when visiting my Swana friends in Botswana, an apartheid Bantustan creation of the South African government of one and a half million souls without their own independently recognized state and appropriate passport, who complained to me why it was that north of the Malopo River, their fellow tribespeople, fewer in number, had been living in their own sovereign state, Botswana, since 1966. We can all see, still, the legacy of the British Empire in African independence, 
and boundaries cutting across tribal territories using lines of latitude and longitude without natural features on the ground. It is true that most of the past and present conflicts in the world are precipitated by ill-considered boundaries taking little account of the wishes, identities, cultural and linguistic characteristics or relationships of those affected. There can be no better example and one which so exemplifies the inherent dangers and tensions as the division between North and South Korea along the 38th parallel. After a millennium of being a unified political entity, not only was that division at the end of the Second World War the result of an absence of political planning for the future by the Allies, but also an understanding reached between the United States and the Soviet Union in the last days of the war that Soviet troops would occupy the parts of Korea north of the 38th parallel and US troops would occupy those south of this dividing line. The rest is recent history of which we are all too well aware. It was of course meant to be only a temporary arrangement until the Korean trusteeship could be implemented leading to the establishment of a unified Korean state over the entire peninsula. The UN failed to find a compromise acceptable to both powers and the two separated states came into being. Like so many such temporary provisions in other parts of the world, it has now become established de facto. We should not forget also that after the tragedy of the war, in effect, a civil war, but with significant external intervention, there remains technically a state of war between the two. There is only an armistice. The natural and obvious answer to divisions of those with a common heritage which exists not just in Korea, but also, as I've mentioned, in other parts of the world, is, of course, to bring them together, to unify. That must be the abiding goal, however unlikely it may seem at present. Yet, extraordinary things have happened within our lifetime. The fall of the Berlin Wall, the reunification of Germany, peace in Northern Ireland that was referred to earlier, events that were unforeseen only a few years prior to their occurrence. We should never underestimate the capacity for change from within, which often goes undetected by external observers. I well remember in the early 1980s going with British nuclear scientists to Moscow at the invitation of the then Soviet Academy of Sciences to talk about mutual inspection of nuclear tests. We met the then apparatchiks of the Soviet Union, such as Georgi Arbatov and Gennady Gerasimov, who mouthed the party line and showed no signs of any fissures in that edifice. Yet, only a few years later, Glasnost and Perestroika had arrived and those same individuals were supporting the reforms. We should not lose hope, but should prosper the ways of diplomacy. Experts in this area are of the firm view that North Korea will not give up its nuclear weapons in the knowledge that it is such a strong bargaining tool to try to reduce sanctions, as well as gaining a perceived credibility on the world stage for its leaders. If so, that will require sacrifices from the West, which may not be reciprocated, and we must ask if these are acceptable. The record of accommodation and appeasement with dictators throughout history, especially in the last century, is not encouraging. Nevertheless, dialogue is critical. That dialogue can be enhanced and supplemented by parliamentarians from those countries that are engaged as not being representatives of the governments, they can have greater latitude to examine areas of interest and aspiration in an environment that is seen as less threatening with fewer diplomatic consequences. Their greater capacity to ascertain real issues of contention and red lines can be fed into the greater discussion, sometimes in a way more informative than even the most sophisticated intelligence service can provide. As I've sought to demonstrate, history teaches us that it is often the unexpected than the anticipated that causes seismic shifts in any situation. Last year, there was great speculation as to the health of Kim Jong-un, albeit still a young man. His sister, one of the few around him whom he trusts, Kim Yo-jong is the deputy director of the United Front and seems now to be charged with responsibility for 
for relations between the two Koreas. She was met with great interest when she visited South Korea in 2018, first of the dynasty to visit the South since the war, and invited the president of South Korea, Moon Jae-in, to visit Pyongyang at the earliest date possible for what would be the first summit between the two nations in more than a decade. Will that take place with a change in administration in Washington? If anything untoward were to happen to the Supreme Leader, what would be her role in an admittedly male-dominated political society, but one where the bloodline is of enormous importance? Most politicians necessarily concern themselves with the present. With Korea, we should be concerned more about the future while seeking to cut through the haze of what the DPRK really wants. That can be ascertained, even if only darkly, through dialogue. As John Bolton has declared about the interaction between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, the building of personal relationships is important in international diplomacy and building of trust, but cannot always be coincidental with the interests of their respective countries. And of course, in democratic countries, leaders and policies change. That is not a reason for seeking to build those relationships. It may well be that a participant returns from such a session holding little else than a scrap of paper, declaring peace in our time, only to find those hopes devastatingly dashed. But it is not always like that. Real mm -hmm. prospect can be made. Uh, let me end by saying, about the role of the EU. There is an enormous capacity there for the EU to act as an honest broker in these issues. And already uh, moves have been made along those lines, which I hope very much will continue. Uh, it is to be seen if the EU can develop a critical friend approach towards US policy on DPRK, as it has on, for example, the Iran nuclear arrangement. History will be a harsh judge of our actions if we miss the opportunity to foster better relations. Of course, the differences may be too profound and the divide too deep to cross. We may fail, but that does not mean that we should not try. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Honorable Best, for your great insights. And now it's time for me to invite a woman speaker. It's my pleasure to give the floor to Baroness Indip Perma a member of the UK's House of Lords and chair of the UN Women's National Committee UK. Baroness Verma held the positions of parliamentarily under secretary for the development of international development and uh, then the Department of Energy and Climate Change. Uh, Baroness Verma, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, Maria. And it is a great honor to be here um, joining all of you and fellow panelists, our honourable members from across the world, and it is an extremely great pleasure to follow on from the Honourable Keith Best, who absolutely lays out um, the regional challenges and the barriers, but also the need for will and opportunity to be able to, to try and address some of the big issues of the day. However, um, having gone through such a detailed journey with Keith just now, I wanted to look at the wider implications of global geopolitical thinking, peacekeeping, and also how do we look at friends in the region and what their roles are, and how do we ensure that not only parliamentarians in the great emerged economies have a great say, but those that are coming behind as the great developing emerging economies that will have the biggest influence on the remainder of this century. And I think for us, the debate must be about greater interaction between all parliamentarians. And I know that those that are on this call, uh, this um, seminar today, are all great believers of being able to collaborate, to come together, to share thoughts, best practice, look at issues in a very critical fashion, but deliver outcomes and solutions in a positive um, friendship, relationship building um, way that has been the best successful route of all governments, of all flares, uh, colours in the past. And I want to look at the world as it stands today. 
We're talking about the two parts of um, the Korean Peninsula. But of course, there are many nations across the world that are facing challenges such as this. And on top of that, we're dealing with what is the biggest challenge that the whole globe has got to contend with today. And that is this COVID pandemic that has brought the world to its knees. And what has come out of this clearly, clearly is that it may be able to respond globally. And that means having shared interests, making sure that the world's health systems um, are properly strengthened and that we actually expose where the weaknesses lie so that we do not have to, in another pandemic, face the sort of hysterical um, migration of, of looking at richer countries taking on the, the, the vaccine um, outcomes for their own nations and then waiting for their own nations to be um, well, and, and safe from the uh, COVID and then giving it to poorer nations. This is what causes, um, I believe very strongly, the sort of rifts that we see across the globe today. And we have all, through all, every single one of us sitting on this call, this um, seminar today, will know that there are countries across the globe where there are internal rifts that continue today because of disparities, because of unfairness. And, you know, I look, at, I look at countries from where I come from. I mean, my, my ancestry is with India. And India, even today, has huge internal challenges, not because it does not want to have a united country, but because until the disparities are eradicated, we will constantly be looking at how, how do we manage um, population growth? How do we manage and how do we manage the partnership and relationship working that this world expects of us? We have seen some terrible, terrible crimes um, across the years through wars, through, through um, conflict, through humanitarian despair. And all of this leads to the same outcomes that unless we understand, and that is where parliamentarians have a key role to play, and I follow on from what Keith has said, that parliamentarians' role is not just about the outcomes in their own countries. It is about how they manage the relationships across parliament, across the world, to be able to dialogue is critical. That engagement, which is it's, uh, truly needed, and that will to come together and tackle issues collectively. And, you know, when we talk about past administrations, it is really easy to cause a com confrontation by the language we use, by the way we approach things. And that's why, and I hope the panelists and um, the, the people listening to this um, uh, seminar today don't mind me referring to the inequalities of how politics takes place, where, where the voices of the 50% of the population are very rarely heard, where we don't include strong um, local grassroots inputs into the way we demonstrate the need for policy development. And when we talk about South Korea and North Korea, there is an obvious divide. There is an obvious demonstration of countries that are open and, and are able to be transparent and accountable to their people, how their process is measured against those, those countries where there are shutdown of, of um, democracy, where we don't get the open debate, where we don't get people being able to be openly critical for the benefit of the wider good. So I think for us as parliamentarians, I see this initiative as a great initiative of being candid, of being open, of being transparent, of being able to have a debate where we can challenge each other, where we can come together, where we see a common good and where we make sure that countries are held accountable by ensuring that power is given into the hands 
of the people, because the people ultimately are the ones that will either benefit or lose out when poor governments, when poor um, e economies are not held accountable. I came, I fell into politics because I saw the disparity of people around me. And I know people genuinely come into the political space to make a positive difference. And I know every single one that is sitting on this um, seminar today, listening, wants to do the right thing. But how do we do it if we're so frightened to challenge what is not right in front of us? How do we do it when we can't have an honest, open debate? And I think that is why it's really, really important that engagement comes at all levels. But more importantly, for all of us that take on public service in whichever guise it comes in, that we take on that public service to know that ultimately we all have a duty to share our worldly wealth, the ability to educate people, the ability to provide good health services, the ability to ensure that people know what their civic rights are, and that the ability of governments to be held properly to account. And too many governments at this moment in time are not being challenged enough. What is the way to do this is to regionally strengthen countries is to regionally have that open dialogue. It is regionally be enabled to engage parliament to parliament, parliamentarians to parliamentarians. And you're right, Keith. Keith talked about the fact that you don't have to be in government to bring changes. In fact, parliamentarians and, and strong civic groups coming together with the business world are the biggest game changers. In, 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 in the landscape of politics. And I think that for me, it is one of those issues where we can talk about countries we all know well. Today, the news headlines across the globe are about the devastation of COVID on the Indian economy, on the Indian people, where the highest numbers of deaths are being reported, where the health systems are buckling under the pressure of patients. And yet in the region, there are countries that will be going through exactly the same thing if we don't contain it, if we don't tackle this together. So their neighbors need to be reaching out there and being supportive. Their neighbors need to make sure that whatever political differences we all have at this moment in time, all political differences need to be put on one side for the goal of the common good of the globe. And you know, India has gone through a transformation of people living in India that come from across different communities and they've learned to come together. We need to come together. We need to hold our governments to account, but we also need to be the biggest um, supporters of humanitarian um, uh, results. And let us all come together on that. And I thank you all for allowing me this opportunity to speak today, because this is a this these issues are never going to be resolved by one superpower or another. They are going to be resolved because all of the countries of the globe come together to make sure it happens. Thank you, Baroness Verma. Uh, indeed, Parliament members have a imp very important role. Uh, now let us have a little bit of time uh, for questions and answers. So we have this time, but not, not so much, unfortunately. So uh, I will answer the question from the audience. And uh, so whoever feels like answering, please do so, okay? So the question is, uh, at the previous panel, Dr. Knessel, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Austria, shared her opinion that the involvement of European nations in the GCPOA somehow maintained the agreement with Iran, even after USA had withdrawn uh, under former President Trump. Do you think this will influence North Korea to have more trust in a future international agreement if the EU is involved? Who would like to, yeah. yes, please, Honorable Best. Yes. I. Um, uh, 
I, I think very, very firmly that the EU has a central role to, to play. Uh, first of all, and they've all, already got quite a good uh, track record on, on this, and there's been an enormous amount of involvement. And of course, the, the benefit of the uh, European Union is that it has a parliamentary body which consists of 27 different nationalities, uh, all coming together. It is, uh, after the United States, the second most powerful trading bloc in the world. Uh, it is uh, one that has got a great deal of maturity uh, and a long history of conflict within itself, which it has managed to resolve. And I've always taken the view that the, the, the European Union is actually the largest peace project the world has ever seen because all those nations for hundreds of years have been tearing each other to pieces and yet now they are in a locked into a peaceful coexistence so i think that acting as i mentioned in my in my few remarks uh, about the way in which they can influence the uh, the jcpoa the iran a nuclear deal uh, as an honest broker, I think they too can say, fulfill that same task in regard to uh, the two careers and actually help act as a catalyst to bring them together. Uh, and I hope that we can see lots more activity from particularly the European Parliament. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your answer. Mar Maria, just... Yeah. On that, though, what yes. is really, really important is that Iran also steps up and, and commits itself to ensuring that it is not going to um, carry on with the, um, the, 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 the development of, of the uranium for, for nuclear uh, weaponry. And we need to hear that loud and clear. And that's not been a message that's been mm. forthcoming so far. So trust has to be on all sides and support for terrorism in its region as well. I mean, yeah. that's another issue that, you know, you can't, you can't have an honest dialogue with a country that is seeking to undermine the rule of law in, in other countries. So that's a very necessary precursor. Okay. Okay, I think we have maybe time for one more question and then uh, uh, we will come to the end of our program. But uh, the question is uh, from uh, Russia. So here it is. Uh, how big are the risks that the Korean Peninsula will once again become a bar uh, bargaining chip between the two powers? Uh, who would like to answer this question? Uh, I'd, I'd like to say that I think that's unlikely. I, I've traveled to Korea maybe a hundred times in the last 20 years. And I, I think the situation of the Koreas, both of them today, is very different than it was right after World War II, when Korea was unknown. And the gap between the, the, the great powers and the smaller countries like Korea was so large. Today, Korea is one of the G20 countries, has many powerful allies. And as we heard from the uh, honorable member from the Russian parliament, a long history of diplomatic relations with Korea. So I, I think... I think it's unlikely that Korea will just become another bargaining chip. However, you know, we one absence on this conference call, of course, it's it's a European call, but we would do well to hear from some Korean parliamentarians as well. It's always easy to look in from the outside, but parliaments change and attitudes change. So I, I think it's very important as we proceed that the uh, voices of Korean parliamentarians and even were it possible, North Korean parliamentarians is the next step. And I know that UPF has a plan to do exactly that uh, in November of this year. So the engagement of all parties is, is absolutely important, but I don't think we're going back to the days of the past. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Balcom. Now we are coming to the end of our webinar and I would like to thank everyone for all your great involvement. Uh, we really appreciate all of you who have attended today's program. 
Now we are looking forward to seeing not only security and peace in Northeast Asia, but also new levels of cooperation between Europe and Asia for stable and sustainable development. Surely uh, the whole world uh, will only benefit from this. Panelists can take this opportunity to wave a goodbye to our international audience at this time. We wish you all good health and great new opportunities. And uh, now I would like to invite all of you for, to, to, to explain to you about the tomorrow's program. Uh, so tomorrow we will have three sessions, each from a different UPF association. You can see the announcement of the three webinars in the chat. Tomorrow's session are the follows. International Media Association for Peace uh, will be at 9.30 Central European time. International Association of First Ladies for Peace at 11.30 Central European time. And International uh, Association of Art and Culture for Peace at 4 p.m. Central European time. Thank you. I am very grateful that we have such a great webinar today. Thank you all of you and see you next time. See you. Thank you.